this is how William Blake's poem, The Tiger, first appeared in 1794. He used a technique called relief etching to create the artwork on his poetry and um, published it himself. The Tiger was one poem in a volume called Songs of Experience and this volume was written by Blake during his most radical period. Uh, he was a free thinker, William Blake, and he raged against the establishment. Everything was held up to question, the church, the monarchy, politicians, even God. In this poem, Blake seems to be questioning God's goodness, which is just not what you did at that time. Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night. What immortal hand or eye could frame thy fearful symmetry? In what distant deeps or skies burnt the fire of thine eyes? On what wings dare he aspire? What the hand dare seize the fire? And what shoulder and what art could twist the sinews of thy heart? And when thy heart began to beat, what dread hand and what dread feet? What the hammer, what the chain, in what furnace was thy brain? What the anvil, what dread grasp dare its deadly terrors clasp? When the stars threw down their spears and watered heaven with their tears, did he smile his work to see? Did he who made the lamb make thee? Tiger, tiger, burning bright in the forests of the night, what immortal hand or eye dare frame thy fearful symmetry? You'll be familiar with the term iambic pentameter because I use it a lot in the other videos and it's a metric form which is very common in English. This is the only poem in the anthology written in trochaic tetrameter and so that's a term that I've obviously got to explain. Well, trochaic, the equivalent of iambic, is um, a series of stressed and unstressed syllables. So you'll hear it if I exaggerate the rhythm in the opening lines. Tiger, tiger, burn bright in the forest of the night. Stressed, unstressed syllables, which give this poem a really compelling, strong rhythm. You can almost hear the tiger pounding through the poem. And tetrameter refers to four stressed syllables in a line. So pentameter, five stressed, we've talked about that in the class. Tetrameter, four stressed syllables per line. Tiger, tiger, burn bright, you can hear them. But the sharpest among you will have noticed that there's an unstressed syllable missing from the end of all of the lines in this poem. And the term for that, obviously it's deliberate, is catalexis. For me, Blake's use of catalexis really hammers home, excuse the pun, the um, rhyme scheme, the rhyming couplets, because the rhyming words are all stressed syllables. So we do hear very strongly both the rhythm and the rhyme in this poem. So this is no quiet music in the background. This is Blake choosing a form which creates a sense of the relentless driving power of that terrifying creature that this poem describes. Finally, I've noted on this slide that the poem is written in six quatrains. Quatrain is a four-line stanza, of course. It's already been said that each quatrain consists of two rhyming couplets, so we have a very neat, um, balanced package in Lakes the Tiger. And adding to that sort of sense of neatness is the fact that the last stanza is exactly the same as the first stanza, except for one word, which is the word dare. In that sense, the poem comes full cycle, and perhaps Blake is suggesting that the questions he poses 
in this poem, and it's full of questions, will never actually be answered, that we'll go round and round and round thinking about these issues, ending where we started, just as the poem does. The tone that Blake creates in this poem is really one of awe, wonder, amazement. He creates that tone partly through the rhyme and rhythm and through the imagery, which we'll explore closely in a minute, but also through the fact that the poem comprises a series of questions, questions that he doesn't answer, and that conveys his sense of bewilderment. Creation is beyond understanding. That's why he's saying it's incredible, awe-inspiring. And he asks as well how a god that created the gentle lamb could also create a ferocious tiger that could easily destroy that lamb. It's a bit like the age-old question, isn't it? If God is good, how can terrible things happen in the world? That's one familiar to most of us. And that's what this poem captures as well. So it's a poem full of questions. It doesn't have any answers. And in the end, the central tone is one of amazement. So this is the opening question. What immortal being, what God, could have created this terrifying creature which, with its perfect proportions, in other words, with its symmetry, is an awesome killing machine, so fearful symmetry. The stanza begins with the repetition of tiger, 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 and this creates a chant-like mood to the whole poem, actually which adds to the sense of mysteriousness which Blake's looking for. Note that the tiger is burning bright. That's not literally burning, of course, this is a metaphor, and it's a metaphor which captures perfectly the fiery orange fur of this awe-inspiring creature. But perhaps on a deeper level, the idea that it's burning bright conveys a sense of energy or power mysterious power, perhaps, that this creature has. The fact that it's in the forests of the night further increases the mystery. This is an elusive animal, while at the same time burning with some inner force. I've already said that Blake was a radical poet. We saw that radicalism in the first stanza, actually, because he's asking, who made the tiger? which is um, an outrageous question to ask in the 18th century. Now he's asking, was the tiger made in hell, in the distant deeps, or in the skies, in other words, in heaven? The metaphor of burning from line one returns with the burning fire of the tiger's eyes, adding to the power and fearfulness of the image again. In the second couplet, Blake is questioning the nature of the creator. And this poem is, in fact, more about creation than it is about the tiger itself, really. So, if the creator has wings, on what wings dare he aspire? Then how is it that he can work with fire? How dare he seize the fire that is necessary to make this ferocious creature a tiger? How can that happen? The relentless questioning continues with the next stanza, which begins with the word and. So, again, the sense of questions propelling us through this poem. Blake urgently searching answers, but never finding them. Now he's asking, what creative being could have had the strength and the craftsmanship to create this creature? So that's where we get shoulder from. Shoulder is a reference to strength, and what shoulder? Who was strong enough? And what are? Who had the craftsmanship to create this heart that drives the tiger forward? And when that craftsmanship is complete and the heart begins to beat, then further questions. What dread hand and what dread feet stands before the tiger? In other words, who is it and stands there in front of this 
creation and continues with the work? Blake doesn't seem to know the answer to that question, but clearly he's indicating here with that repetition of the word dread that this is no benevolent, loving God in the way that we usually conceive him. These lines further question how the tiger was created. Here Blake uses the metaphor of the blacksmith who forms metal with a hammer, uses a furnace and an anvil. Notice that the um, rhythm in this stanza throughout the poem is um, very strong, adding further to the chant-like quality that we talked about in relation to lines one and two, what the hammer, what the chain, and so on. We also get the sense that the pace and volume is being picked up now, since the questions are coming thick and fast, they're shorter questions, there are more of them, and we get an exclamation mark as well as the intensity of the poem grows. Punctuation always matters in poetry, of course it does, and this is the only exclamation mark. More correctly, it should be a question mark, shouldn't it? So we have here a, a climax within the poem as Blake asks this question of who was it dared to grasp this deadly creation, which is the tiger. When the work was finished in that furnace, when that hot, dangerous task was done and this fearsome beast emerged out of it complete, who dared clasp it? Who dared lay hands on this thing? Something truly awe-inspiring. This stanza asks, when the stars cast their light on the new being, the new creation, the tiger, in other words, when they threw down their spears, and when the clouds cried, watered heaven, was the maker pleased with his creation? Did he smile upon the tiger? Was he pleased with what he had created in that burning furnace of the last stanza? This is the most overtly Christian stanza within the poem because it introduces the lamb. Now the lamb symbolises Jesus, doesn't it? Jesus Christ, the lamb of God. So as the tradition holds, animals such as lambs were sacrificed to God or gods in general until the Christian God offered his son, Jesus Christ, his lamb, if you like, as the final sacrifice for the sins of mankind. So a huge question, how could this Christian God who sacrificed his son so that we could have eternal life, how could this God, this loving God, also create terrifying, burning, killing machine. And was he happy with his work? It's also worth knowing that Blake actually wrote a poem called The Lamb, where he asks the lamb who made him. So very similar to the tiger, and they often appear together in anthologies, actually, as a, as a pair of poems. But The Lamb first appeared in a volume called Songs of Innocence, where Blake's view of the world was much more carefree, more innocent, and those poems sort of idealise the world that we live in, an idealised creation. Songs of experience seem to reflect um, a bitterness and a growing radicalism, and we can see that in this poem, can't we, where Blake asks, how could a God who gave us the lamb, literally the lamb, that sweet, innocent creature, as well as Jesus, how could that God also create the tiger. In this final stanza, the poet repeats the central question of the poem, which is stated in stanza one. However, he changes just one word, which is the word could in line four, and that becomes the word dare in line 24. Now that's a really important change. We notice it because it's the only change in the stanza, which is otherwise repeated perfectly. And so the poet is here no longer asking who had the capability of creating the tiger, who could do this, which is the question in stanza one. He's asking who dared to create such a frightful thing. We've seen that the tiger is a poem made of questions. There are no less than 13 question marks and only one sentence that ends with an exclamation mark instead of a question mark. 
and when it should be a question mark. Um, so really, Blake isn't making a point in this poem so much as asking us to think, asking us to engage with his struggle to understand. Who made you, Tiger? He asks in the first question. So these are questions about creation, essentially. Who made you? Where? Why? What was the person or thing like that made you? Huge questions, but no answers. And that, I think, is the point of the poem, really. But we don't know, ultimately. It's about creation as an infinitely mysterious, amazing, awe-inspiring thing that we could never seek to fully understand or explain. It's interesting as well that Blake refers to the creator in terms of his body parts. We have hands, eyes, shoulders and feet, as we've seen, rather than the whole being. And this seems to contribute to the mystery of who or what the creator actually is. It's a bit like having a few extreme close-up shots of a person see just the parts but you can't see the whole package and that means you never really know who or what you're looking at. The final point worth making in this section is that in Blake's day religious people and their institutions held great power over people far more than they do now in Europe so questioning God's absolute authority was pretty rare but Blake does precisely that, doesn't he? He questions who could create the tiger. The fact that he asks that question shows that he's casting aside the notion of an all-powerful, omnipotent God because there's not a simple answer to the question. Maybe it was the devil. Who knows? Certainly in thinking about the terrible ferocity and awesome symmetry of the tiger, the speaker in the poems at a loss to explain how the same God who made the lamb could make this thing, this tiger. Hence the, the main theme of the poem really, that we can't ever fully understand the mind of God and the mystery of creation. Before Blake wrote Songs of Experience, he published Songs of Innocence. I mentioned that earlier, in fact. And in Songs of Innocence, he explores the point of view of a very young child. And in The Lamb, from that volume, the young child asks, who created thee? And gets a simple, reassuring answer. A loving God created the Lamb. In Songs of Experience, Blake is exploring the point of view of an older child, a child who has experienced emotions like envy and fear. And The Tiger is a poem full of fear. The idea that it's stalking through the forests of the night immediately conveys that sense of fear. So the voice that we hear, this older child's voice, is certainly darker and more troubled than the voice that we hear in the idyllic Songs of Innocence. 